Hi everyone, I'm Christine Hicks here at the National Museum of the Pacific War. I'm curator here and I'm here with David Krigbaum. Uh, he is the curator of this exhibit focusing on Japanese teenagers and their efforts during World War II. He has worked with us previously uh, with some webinars focusing on Japanese sites and how they are today. So David, tell us how and why you chose this subject to feature, enough for you to do an exhibit on. Well, I used to give presentations at on-base high schools, uh, I'm stationed in Japan, about uh, Philippine scouts and the Choctaw Code Talkers of World War I. When I gave these presentations, I would come in wearing the full uniform of these soldiers, and I'd have the pack with me, and I'd have the items I could show them to really bring the topic to life. And I thought, I want to do something that was specific to them, something that would be aimed at them, and I thought, well, I'm a writer and I've met and interviewed air raid survivors and my wife's grandmother, she's Japanese, also was a war worker when she was a teenager. I thought, what if I were to make a presentation geared toward teenagers about people their own age and what they did during the war in Japan, you know, right where they lived in Sasebo. And so like with the other collections, I started putting together a collection focused on that and it kind of just grew from there. And I did a lot of study about, uh, well, home front life and got very interested in on the topic as I learned more and more and I met people and I uh, kind of just took in more information and this collection just kind of grew like a weed. Absolutely. Filled up our entire gallery <laughs> and ev almost every single exhibit case. So what do you, besides, you talked about teenagers in Sasebo on the U.S. bases. Besides that audience, what would your audience, what would you like them to gain from this exhibit? Teenagers and others. Well, I, I hope it would be, it, it would show people a bit about what life was like for people on the other side of the war. Um, learn what it was like for civilians and the way they went about their lives. And it was a very different country than the United States. And I know it's not very well known, especially outside of Japan. So hopefully people will take away a greater understanding of that aspect of World War II at the time. Uh, especially on that subject matter, how we kind of relate to Japanese in the war effort, we kind of take it from our own experience in America. So we're going to talk about maybe some similarities and differences on the subject from Americans and Japanese. So for, during the war effort, uh, how is rationing different for these uh, kids in America versus like the Japanese versus their American counterparts? Well, Japanese rationing is a little bit of a different animal because you have to look at where it began. So with Japan, you started with austerity measures in the late 1930s when they were at war with China. By Feb um, 41, early 41, they had begun rationing rice. By the end of 41, they had attacked the United States, Great Britain, and therefore its Commonwealth, and also the Dutch. And so rationing grew even greater until pretty much everything was being rationed. So you're talking about everything being under this purview of rationed goods. And as the war went on, that shrank and shrank and shrank. Par partially with this is because Japan is, a is a, it's an island nation. It needs its goods shipped in from around the empire. And even within the islands themselves, you have to think, have items moved by train and by ship. Well, the military gets first crack at all logistics. And so with the military having priority, that doesn't leave as quite so much to move around goods for non-military needs. Also, you had to consider air raids. As Ms. Fujisawa, the, uh, the woman who I interviewed about her life as a Gokto Doing student draftee, as she said that during the Sasawa air raid, their food distribution center burned down. Well, you had to buy goods from the food distribution centers uh, were, well, I use that term, but that's just how we kind of translated what she had said. But you could only buy food from certain places. Without that, how do you get food? Well, that's not the government's problem. You have to follow the rules. Her relatives tried to mail them fresh fruit. It got confiscated en route in the mail. So she had to go take a train to Agami village go door to door and 
basically illegally buy rice from people. And then she had to walk six miles home with her bag of ill-gotten rice because if she had gotten back on the train, the police would have confiscated the rice at Sasso Station. That is a situation I doubt most American teens would have to worry about when it came to where do you find goods or where do you find food after all the legal venues no longer exist because of an air raid. Absolutely. And continuing with the comparison of Jap the Japanese teens versus American teens, what are some, you said you just uh, described a major difference. Can you describe any more major differences? Uh, another one would be uh, firefighting because as I mentioned, the air raids, so even before the air raids began, even in the 1930s, Japan was very conscious of the potential for air raids. In fact, uh, Osaka, I believe, began doing its first drills in 1928. I may be a little bit off on that one, but they've, they've longer had a consciousness of the potential to be bombed, and so everyone was expected to be able to be their own firefighter. Japan only had a handful of professional full-time fire departments in the nation, and those were in the big cities. And so, generally speaking, you were your first line of defense for your neighborhood. And so Japanese teenagers, like their adult counterparts, had to know how to put out fires, be part of bucket brigades, use sand, use the hitataki, which is a fire, the fire beater. It's a, a bamboo mop with a knotted head. It looks like a big bamboo mop with a knotted head. You wet it down, you smack fire. Ms. Fujisawa said it was actually really good against um, fire bombs. Individual little bombs you could smack out. But when they come down in a canister 37 at a time, you cannot smack them all out at once. And another difference I saw was students training for air raids, a big difference I saw between the Americans and teens. I don't, I don't feel, or I haven't seen an example of teens really uh, learning first aid at school and learning gas mask, working with gas masks, or learning how to, uh, as seen as our, in our exhibit, carrying people on stretchers and very young as well. Now we go to the similarities. Do you find some similarities between the experience of Japanese teens and American teenagers? There's some. Um, I think on a basic level, you had similarities in terms of everyone's trying to do their part for their country. Um, you have things like scrap metal drives. You have things like war bonds. Uh, some of that stuff is similar but different the way the Japanese executed it was a lot more of a communal thing because of the neighborhood associations. Now neighborhood associations were something everyone had to join because this is where you would get your rations through. It was a way of neighbors policing and helping each other. There are good and bad aspects of it depending on how you look at it but I do know people who did look at it rather positively in general as they helped each other out. But because every neighborhood is different, there's no universal experience. Some of them were more mandatory in terms of, we will do a scrap drive. We will be buying war bonds as a community. We are, take, we are tracking who is pulling their own weight and who is not. Now, I do have an anecdote from my wife's grandmother, Miss Iseki Sui. Miss uh, Iseki, I used, to, I used to just call her Bachan, that means grandmother. She um, left behind her wartime memoirs before, well, after she passed. And she had a story that I thought, this could be any teenager in any country. So she was a 16-year-old typist at the Kawatana Torpedo Factory, or officially the Kawatana Naval Factory. And what she did was, she was a typist, but she could also build torpedoes. She was very flexible. But uh, one day she said to her friend, hey, Let's go, um, let's go play on that hill out back. They play, were playing hooky from work, so they snuck out of the office. That's when someone called Halt. It was the Kempe Tai, military police. Now, the Kempe, I'm not sure if you've read about them, but they are almost, it seems, universally cartoonishly paranoid. Um, they, see, they tended to view everyone as either guilty were hiding it well. And he knew these girls were up to something. 
So he calls them the hulk, demands their documents, demands to look at their tools, pats them down. And he's getting frustrated because he knows these girls are up to something and he doesn't know what. Finally, he just yells, Get's go away. And she said she was scared. He had struck out and was angry that he did not figure out what they were, what the, they were up to. And it was just trying to goof off of work. Oh, uh, we did mention, uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong. You basically, when you are given these jobs as teens, you're not allowed to quit. Was that? That's correct. We had a tour recently of 15 year olds come through and I told them that. And I, I always wonder what they would have thank would think of that. So uh, mm. speaking of continuing to compare and contrast, um, Another major question I had for you was the difference between the Japanese teens, females, and males. Well, in Japanese culture, it was expected that as a man, you would want to be a soldier. You would want to fight for your country. As a woman, you should want to have a husband and be a great mother and have as many children as possible who will grow up to also become great soldiers. Mm -hmm. And I think, I believe you uh, sent me, there's a direct uh, quote from, I think it's women in war in Japan. Mm -hmm. It's uh, men are a wartime resource and women are a, a reproductive resource. It was something to that effect, yes. And that extends to uh, the teenagers, I'm assuming? Well, I think the idea was that you were preparing for that. Oh, um, okay. The idea is that this is what you, like, as we saw in the Shashin Shuho magazine, there's a whole article about teenage girls um, called what, Mothers in Sailor Suits. Mm -hmm. It was just about learning the skills for motherhood when they're still in school. Mm -hmm. And the Shashin Shuho, mm -hmm. uh, I'm saying it correctly, is a propaganda magazine produced by the Japanese. Yes. And uh, with quite a bit of pregnancy propaganda. After all this labor and these experiences that these children, essentially teenagers, but they are quite young, experience, how did this affect them uh, after the war ended? How did this, how did, was there major shifts in uh, the industry workforce, trauma, et cetera? Well, what I saw was that for a lot of people, it was just picking up where they had left off. You had children with incomplete educations, trying to pick up those, trying to finish out their education. You had people just looking for work when you have families where say the father is now missing if they never came back from China or from wherever. Well, now you're out just doing whatever you can to make money to take care of yourself and your family. Now, in the case of Miss Fujisawa, uh, Miss uh, Iwamoto uh, Shizue, this is her maiden name, she finished her education and she became a teacher the way that she had wanted to before being, um, being sent to the factory. But when we're talking about permanent trauma. She is, from one year of being a welder at the Naval Arsenal, she had mostly went blind in one eye. So imagine by the age of 17 and you've lost the use of one eye. And uh, a lot of other factory workers developed specific ailments to the materials they worked with and some of them plagued them for their entire lives. Um, it was pretty common for someone who had worked with materials that are poisonous or dangerous to develop symptoms that would never fully go away. Absolutely. And is there anything else that you, any last uh, comments that you would like to make in regards to this e exhibit? What you would like to tell? What would you like to talk about on the subject? Well, I'm just happy to have an opportunity to do this with you all. Um, this is something that once I saw this collection, I thought it'd be great if, you know, someday I could actually have it in a proper museum where a lot more people could see it than simply, well, like I said, I love taking this out to schools, but that's kind of limited the number of people who can see it and, and learn from it. And to me, the most important thing about making a collection like this is that these to me are learning tools. They are here so that we can learn from the past and from them and hopefully by seeing this, it's like, well, what is that? I've never heard of that. And it gets people more interested in learning than, and I think that's more effective than simply reading pages in a book. I mean, books are a great place to start, but 
to, to kind of make it more real than just words. And I hope that people come here, learn something from this, and the stories of the people here, and uh, carry on. And also on a personal note, uh, for my wife, she is very touched that her grandmother's story is being learned by people who never got to meet her in life. And then that way, um, Bajan's story lives on after her. As I mentioned, she passed away a couple of years ago when she left her, mem mem her memoirs behind. And so I'm really happy that we can spread that. Oh, absolutely. That's wonderful. And we're happy to have you uh, show your exhibit here. And it's already, it's only been up for a little bit, but we're already getting some great feedback. So that's absolutely wonderful. So more on a focus on, as you call them, your learning tools. Uh, we're gonna talk about more of the objects in specific okay. uh, uh, featured in this, this exhibit. So you mentioned the good luck flag, and you're gonna have to help me with the pronunciation on the actual terminology for this, which is your favorite object. Yes. So you wanted to tell us a little bit about that. Well, yeah. So. Normally, good luck flags you find for sale are um, their war trophies, and I just simply didn't want to handle that. Um, this is about the Japanese home front, and I wouldn't have felt comfortable. And so the way I got this flag was very moving. So this flag belonged to Mr. Okubo Kankichi. He, uh, I bl believe he was part of the 48th Division. He uh, was trained in Omura. He's from uh, Saga Prefecture. Uh, Saga is near Nagasaki Prefecture, if you're familiar with Japanese um, geography. Well, he carried this flag to war with him. It was signed by his friends, family, and co-workers. He came home alive from the war, and this was a family heirloom. And so one day I was talking to Ms. Tomoe at the Navy Exchange in Sasebo, and I had mentioned what I was doing with the school presentations, and she says, oh, why my grandfather's flag? I asked, can I have a picture of it that I can share with the kids? Well, the next day she comes back and says, I talked to my brother, do you want the flag? And she says, they found it in a box, nicely folded inside of her grandmother's purse. Oh. So it would have been something that, it, to me, it sounds like she was carrying it after he passed. Mm -hmm. So this is something that means a lot to their family. They said, we would rather you have it and share it with people than keep it in a box. Mm -hmm. And so I am happy that, again, it is out here where it can be shared with many people mm -hmm. and that I was able to get this to really share something I felt was, it was important to that home front wartime experience because this is something that a lot of people did. This is something that was, I believe, relatable to for many Japanese is having to sign these flags for their, their loved ones and friends and colleagues who were being sent to war. And especially since you know the provenance of yeah. the good luck flag, it's quite significant as well. Sometimes you get, you read Japanese, but when we get... <laughs> but another major object you talked about, and we've talked about previously, even in this interview, uh, was the Shashin Juho. It's the mm -hmm. propaganda magazine published by the Japanese, and you wanted to talk more about that. Yeah, so I find these really interesting because it is a window into what the Japanese people saw. And so this was the war from the perspective they were given. I mean, now we have decades of hindsight. We can research and uh, sift through original materials, translations, interpretations, interpretations of interpretations. Back then, this was, this was now, this was the present. And what you saw was what you were shown. There wasn't any internet or any other way to get other information. You either heard from the radio, you saw these pictorials and propaganda. Maybe you heard it from someone who saw something, but generally speaking, this was what you, what you were shown. You saw that Japan was ever victorious. This particular issue that we have here um, stood out to me because uh, one of the first things I got really big into studying was the Battle of Bataan. I have adopted Filipino family and they live on Bataan. And so it has the end of the battle there. We have the American flag uh, over some M1 Grands and barbed wire as you know, victorious Japan liberates the Philippines. And then you have the Doolittle Raid, you know, cowardly, it, it, Americans attack civilians, but don't worry, there was little damage. Mm -hmm. Then you have the whole thing about 
You need to get married young, get married now, have lots of babies. Mm -hmm. You need to up the birth rate. These children are learning how to be good mothers. And it's a snapshot of, of Japan at the time, at least from the government's perspective and what people were seeing. I Absolutely. think that's important. And I think it's really significant because right after the publication of this journal, um, the, the Battle of the Coral Sea would happen, and then the Battle of Midway, and then the Battle of Guadalcanal. Mm. So it's very much, they're very victorious now, but they're about to be uh, not so much uh, yeah. coming into the future. So it's right on that cuts mm. of that. And so that is, it's quite fascinating. And it's quite fascinating to see the uh, Doodle Raid from the other side and how uh, upset they were on that. Yes. So it's understandable, but uh, it's an interesting perspective. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the other item that you mentioned was the Amon Bukuro. Um, you're gonna- Imon, Imon Bukuro. Okay. Uh, and those are basically, uh, you gotta explain the concept. They're basically care packages. Right. Well, care packages actually came about post-World War II because they were full of the supplies we were stockpiling for the invasion of Japan, but now being taken to Europe to help people who needed food. So the Japanese have been doing Imon Bukuro, the comfort bag, since the beginning of the war with China. This is where Japanese civilians would get together under the auspices of an organization like, I believe it was usually the Women's Association, put together these bags of goods that soldiers would want to have. You'd have toiletries, dried foods, canned food, little games, a letter of encouragement from home. And also um, you'd see things like photos of popular actresses and sometimes early on even lipstick to remind the boys what they were fighting for. Now, what's interesting is the photo we have here mm -hmm. is of Miss uh, Todoroki Yukiko. And I, I got this photo, this bromide, uh, the glamour shot off of, uh, I think it was Yahoo Auctions, mm -hmm. just because it looked a good representation of that type of photograph. Well, I get this and I show it to my wife and she's like, ah, it's Todoroki Yukiko. I'm like, you know who she is? And she says, she says to me, yes, this is Bachan's favorite actress. So I thought, oh, so if Bachan had to have picked an actress to put in the bag, this would have been what she would have put in the bag. I absolutely loved getting that little photo. It's the sweetest little photo. Uh, it's on display now, but it's mm -hmm. the cutest little photo. So as a service enlisted man, what would you mention? Uh, these are all items that you, uh, people on the front would like. What would, what was something, or any of those items of interest to you? Well, what struck me as of interest was the fact that this was basically the exact same things I was getting in care packages in Iraq in 2008. That is what I was about to say. I, as a child, would send care packages to yeah. Iraq and Afghanistan. So that was my personal, I was wondering if there was a, you mentioned care packages are a little different than uh, these Amon. Imon Bukuro. And so they're very different, but there are some similarities right. that, you know, remain to this day. Yeah. So last and not least, uh, we have some of the outfits that we have on our mannequins. Uh, you wanted to feature the monope and then the Kebudan, um uniform? Uh, yes, the monope and the Kebodan uniform. Kebodan. So the monope is, to me, has an interesting story. So monope are um, work clothes made out of kimono. Now, as part of that push for national austerity, women were told to make monpe, to cut up their kimono into this practical work clothes. And so you can find monpe being, they're still work clothes. It, this isn't something that stopped existing after the war, it just stopped being mandatory. But um, you can find pants or a jacket, but you never find the matched top and bottom set. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to get that as an example of more of a wartime monpe than just general farm clothes, one pay. Well, I was in luck because I was at the Showa, uh, Showa no Karashi, the Showa Living History Museum, and they put me in touch with a seamstress who makes monpe. And so she, I bought a pair off of her that was the match style of top and bottom. And she had said, well, it's a little small for an adult. And I said, that, that's fine. It's, she said it was child size. I said, it's fine, it's just for display. 
I have a set of work clothes for what I'm assuming was a teenage girl. Um, it's, it's a real set of World War II coveralls or overalls, but her blouse has sailor suit piping. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming it may have come from a school uniform initially. Now, women back then and people in general were smaller. Um, Miss, uh, Miss uh, Fujisawa, who I mentioned, she was tall. She said when she was 12, she hit full adult height and she was awkward about it because she was a whopping four foot 11. As a 12 year old, she was huge. That's adult height. A friend of mine, um, her, her mother is from that generation. She's Japanese. And she said her mom and her two sisters, so all three of them as adults never got past four foot 10. So at five foot two, they called her the tall one in the family. Perspective, it's yes. all about perspective. Yes. And I actually saw there's uh, now kind of a, gr um, I was looking up the pants, yes. uh, the tie up pants. And yes. They're actually now becoming a little more popular. I guess it, they're easy to fit and easy mm -hmm. to make. And they're on a lot of modern uh, websites now, uh, yes. which, is, which was an interesting, uh, or interesting thing to find when uh, looking up the inventory of your exhibit. And uh, lastly, we were going to talk about the, and you, the uniform. Yes, the Cable Dawn. So Cable Dawn were civil defense volunteers. As I mentioned earlier, um, Japan had very limited firefighting capability and basically it's up to you to take care of your neighborhood. Um, Cable Dawn were the people who facilitated that. They were involved with training. So you would see them at air raid drills, teaching and uh, supervising what to do during, uh, before an air raid, they were involved with uh, early warning. So bombers were coming, they're supposed to get the word out. During the air raids, they would direct activities and afterwards they were also involved with the um, post air raid um, cleanup, looking for, looking for people, that kind of thing. And so they were an integral part of Japanese society during wartime. They grew out of the pre-war firefighting volunteer groups, but they go away after the war when there's, of course, no longer a need for um, civil defense. But I, I found that rather interesting. It's something that you never really hear about or see much about. So I was happy to find the uniform and have the chance to talk about that aspect of Japanese wartime life. And they also, like I said, they were men, but at the end of the war, they were also employing women as well. And I believe you could be 17 and be part of this organization. Okay, yeah. absolutely fascinating. Well, thank you, David, for talking with us. And we're so glad to have you and your exhibit here at the National Museum of the Pacific War. Uh, thank you, everyone. And we'll be uh, answering some questions live. Hi everyone, uh, once again, this is Christine Hicks, curator at the National Museum of Pacific War. Uh, joining me today is David Krigbaum, uh, live from Japan. Uh, hi David, how are you? Hello, I'm we doing all right, you, thank you. Well, we hope that you enjoyed the video and now we are gonna get to some questions. So uh, the first question I had, me in our interview, we talked extensively about your favorite objects and then also some various objects throughout the exhibit. But the question I had was, which was the hardest uh, object to acquire for this exhibit? The hardest to acquire is the, um, the uh, good luck flag. So, so with that, those are personal items that were given to soldiers uh, upon their departing for war. And, I I didn't want to go buy a war trophy, um, given what I'm doing. It just didn't seem like that would be the correct way of going about it. And so I never thought I'd be able to get a flag. But uh, through a fortuitous uh, circumstance, I met Miss Tumway at the Navy Exchange, who she Miss Tumway works there at the Navy Exchange in Sasebo and. I, she saw some of, I had my mail with me full of World War II antiques. And I told her what I was doing and she's like, oh, you know, my grandfather has a flag like that. I said, oh, I see a picture of it. And well, she talked to her brother and she said, well, do you 
do you want the flag? We would rather you share this with children for your presentations than just keep it up in a box. Now, this flag they had found, it had been nicely folded up in her grandmother's purse and kept in a box where they found it. So clearly this thing was important to their grandmother. And well, I'm assuming it passed on at this point. And so with that, I was able to share this with many people who would have otherwise never seen this item. And, you know, it's more to the point, it's someone's personal heirloom. This has someone's personal family history attached to it. And from what I learned about it, he came from Saga. Okubo Kankichi was the man's name. He came from Saga Prefecture, which is just beside Nagasaki Prefecture, was likely attached to the 48th uh, Infantry or 48th Division, excuse me, and served in the occupation of the Philippines and Dutch East Indies, which is now uh, Indonesia. And he came home alive with this flag. Absolutely. And I love to see, of course, in our collection, we have those type of flags, but it's from a different type of acquisition. But it's wonderful to see that uh, now on display, especially with the support of the bank. So yeah. our next question comes from Stephen. Uh, his question is, I'm sure that Japanese teens questioning the government or the military would have met with quick consequences. Is this correct? Yes. Generally, anyone openly questioning a government could find themselves in a lot of trouble. And this could be, I mean, it could just be mumbling about something being bad. This isn't, how do I put it? In Japan, uh, there's not a lot of how I, universal across the board. Everything is like this everywhere. You'll find there's a lot of differences locally. But generally speaking, yes, speaking ill of the government or questioning the government is a good way to get yourself in trouble, not just with the government itself, but with the, the people around you who will not like to hear such talk. Uh, next question for me was, uh, how is it like to acquire these art? How is it like collecting artifacts in Japan uh, in comparison to maybe the U.S. or other countries? Well, where I live, it's a little bit trickier. Um, so I don't live near any places with great flea markets. Uh, so I do actually a lot of shopping online through antique shops and such. But when I can, I go to, I usually will go down to local flea markets or old, or like uh, places like, excuse me, like um, Tokyo sometimes has uh, the flea market at the Ueno, I think it was Ueno Park. And there I found this guy had a bunch of the propaganda magazines for $10. Okay, so I grabbed like five magazines and he just charged me 20 bucks for a lot of them. So that is one thing where if you try to buy, buy that outside Japan, you're going to be paying full price for each of them. And some things you just don't find. But on the other hand, some of the more oddball items, uh, such as, say, the k on uniform, that I, had to, that I found on an online military antiques website where they specifically are looking for these kind of things to sell. And honestly, seeing something often leads me to say, well, what is that and what does it do? And then researching it and finding a new rabbit hole to go down. Um, I hope that answers your question. Well, thank you. Uh, so our next question is from Scott. Were many teenagers evacuated from the cities to avoid the firebombing? Not teenagers, but small children who were elementary school age children. Um, I believe it was beginning in 1943, the government was encouraging people to send small children out to the uh, country where they'd be less likely to be bombed. An example of this is, uh, I mentioned Miss Fujisawa, her relatives were sending her food that got confiscated by the police en route. Her younger siblings had been sent out to live with relatives on a remote island. And because of that, she said when she was firefighting, during the air raid, she didn't, uh, the Sasso air raid, she didn't have to worry about the safety of the children back at home. As for teenagers though, um, you were of working age. You 
uh, so in Japan, the uh, mandatory education ended at 12. So you could theoretically be in work by the time you're 13. So while there were people in high school, um, a lot of a lot of people were in high schools and junior high schools. They were still um, a working resource. Like uh, another example, of this would be my wife's grandmother, Miss Iseki Sui. She was a 16 year old typist, but she wasn't a Gokto Doen. Um, do we talk about the Gokto Doen, or do I have to explain that? Um, it would be good to explain it again. Uh, okay. We do have extensive panels about it in the exhibit in the temporary gallery, but uh, why don't you explain it again? Okay. So um, during the war, the Japanese government would wholesale draft um, schools into factories. So uh, the example I give was Miss Fujisawa. When she was 15, she was at a girls' school, and her entire school was drafted to go work at the local SASPO Naval Arsenal. And that was that. The school sent the students. They were taught um, particular skills. She was a welder and off they went. And so my wife's grandmother, Sui, she was not a Gokto Doan. She was not in school. She was already in the workforce. And so she applied for jobs as a typist. But when she got into that job, she wasn't allowed to quit, which is something she realized pretty much immediately was this was not a job she wanted. <laughs> she was uh, my, my wife's grandmother was a very self-effacing uh, woman. And so, of course, you, know, you don't say you don't want it, but she very much did not want to work there. Another question I had. So during the process of this exhibit, we were kind of both curators kind of working together, uh, kind of creating this exhibit. Uh, but when you were creating this exhibit, did you look at other ex exhibitions for inspiration or did you just kind of wing it? I actually did find a lot of inspiration in other exhibits. So I'm a big museum fan. I love seeing how museums arrange their collections, how their narrative flow works, the colors they use, lighting even. The way it is displayed helps tell the story just as much as the artifact in the text knowing how much text to put down, how much text, you know, how much is too much, how fast your audience is moving through, like in a school versus an open museum setting. So I looked at a lot of museums. Um, the first big um, kind of touchstone for me, before I put this museum collection together, I had wanted to do this, but I wasn't quite sure how to go about it since this wasn't like my old presentations of bringing in a military pack and uniform. But the, uh, there's a mobile exhibit for the uh, movie In This Corner of the World. It's a story of a young Hiroshima housewife living in Kure about her day-to-day -day life. And they have this mobile exhibit of just daily life items and explaining how they were used. And I thought that's a good reference as to where to begin for what to show people. And I also go to a lot of like local history museums and see the kind of things that they have on display to try to make something that just helps tell this story. And so I kind of took all that information and what I already knew about how to collect and put together my collection. And I love the way you arrange it, by the way. Um, well, my computer's over here, so that's why I keep looking over here. And I, so I, I was saying to Christine, I am, I really appreciate the way she took what I gave her because I gave her the artifacts, the written information and uh, the general arrangement. And she found a way to physically place it all within the room that that looked good and had a nice flow to it. Thank you. Uh, so and now you how many hours did you spend in our museum that you can now use for future exhibitions? Oh, wow. So I was near a museum all day. Um, I went there at opening time. I stopped for lunch and came back and um, I finished at, at closing time. And then, um, and thankfully, one of your guys was nice enough just to let me have like an extra five minutes to finish up in the Nimitz gallery. Uh, and then the next day I had to come back. And I think I spent like one more hour looking at just the rest of the museum. And then finally, I came back the last day um, 
looking for kind of scavenger hunt items like uh like items between what i have in my collection and your collection i spent another two hours doing that and even then i felt like i was rushing it yeah. uh, uh, there's just so much you guys have in terms of uh, artifacts how they're presented stories there's so many little personal stories within it as well as the big picture so many people you could listen to tell their stories at the audio stations it really was a very enjoyable experience. Yeah, it, like I said, if you go, it can take an entire day for anyone who's interested. Absolutely, and I'm glad that you enjoyed it so much. Uh, and we have another question, I believe from Bethany. Uh, we've always been told by my grandfather that my great uncle received kamikaze training as a teenager. Would that have been a possibility? Yes, um, so, the youngest kamikaze, okay, so let me break it down. There's multiple kamikazes. They call them tokotai, which is um, special, um, like special attack squadrons. So you had airborne kamikazes from the Army and Navy. I, I've been to the kamikaze bases, which now have museums at um, Chiran, uh, Bons Bonsai, Tachirai, and Kanoya. Uh, they would train pilots as young as 17. Now, that said, uh, they're, as far as I know, that is the youngest age. There were also um, other toko. There were kamikaze uh, motor torpedo boat, or motor, excuse me, motor boats that were trained at Kawatana, where my wife uh, is from. They also trained, uh, and those were boats, so just imagine a speedboat with 500 pounds of explosives loaded in the nose that would be sent after ships. They trained Fukuryu suicide frogmen. These are men in diving suits with a lunge mine. A lunge mine is a bomb at the end of a stick. That is, they'd go with to, they'd go underwater, and when uh, landing craft came close, they would lunge up with that mine and blow up the landing craft. Ironically, because people volunteered for that suicide duty, they were never sent to war and most of them survived. Uh, there were some deaths in training. There was also suicide torpedoes called um, Kaiten. It is, uh, just think of a big torpedo with a little section put in it, a cockpit for a pilot. And then you also had midget submarines, which could be used on suicide runs as well. And the pilots um, could be drawn from the, uh, the academies, the schools um, for... Uh, I believe it was Aaron Aviation was a big one. And those two, you're looking at um, the upper end of the teens. And we have another question. Uh, it's the, about the Shashin Shuho. Uh, we mm -hmm. talked about it briefly, but there's a question for more clarification. It's from an anonymous person. Uh, was the Japanese go government involved with the making of the Shashin Shuho? Uh, yes, Shashin Shuho was a government product. It was produced by um, the, oh, I cannot say the ministry name correctly, but it was produced by a cabinet level ministry. So this was the official government line on what is happening in the war. And because of that, they could undersell all the other magazines. Their prices were lower. They had the, according to the government, they had the greatest circulation in all the Japanese empire. And so uh, this was the, well, there were other newspapers and magazines out. This was the, like I said, the official government line, and this would have been very easy and the cheapest to get. And we have one last question. So from Scott, uh, so it sounds like there's a lot of current interest in Japan about the warriors. Is that true? Uh, it is picking up, yes. Um, for a long time, it was kind of, it's, it seemed like a, a taboo subject people didn't want to talk about, but it seems that it is becoming more, people are becoming more open about it, especially as people who lived through it are starting to die out. Um, in the city of Saspa, where I lived, when I first got there, they had just begun a process of trying to highlight their naval heritage. Sasebo is a naval town. It was founded, it was a fishing village before the Japanese Navy moved in in the 1880s. By 1902, it is now a full-size city. And so 
it grew with the Navy. The Navy, naval heritage is everywhere. But in the past few years, they've made really made an effort to highlight their old naval structures, their old naval ruins, and to make it more accessible, where before something would have been gated off, it just said, okay, this was a ruin, don't go in. They've now made a clean path so people can go inside and get up close, and it tells the story of this thing. And um, I do see a bit more of that as well. Just um, every year there, I think NHK puts out Achikochi no Suzu-san, which is getting people to tell their family stories and they animate it. And these are just stories of average Japanese people trying to kind of spread awareness and interest in these stories of people's wartime lives, which is kind of in line with the, the stuff that I'm doing with this presentation. So I was very happy to see that because I keep learning new little oddball facts from that. And so hopefully we'll see more of this and there will be more kind of openness about uh, wartime and a lot of information will be saved and preserved and passed down. Absolutely. And thank you for answering our questions. Uh, you mentioned Sasaba earlier. Do you want to highlight uh, the cocktail that you're drinking right now? Okay, so I'm not sure if y'all if y'all have made this yet. This is the Hammerhead Highball. It's named for Sasaba's Hammerhead Crane. Um, so uh, a Hammerhead Crane or a giant cantilever crane is a type of big, it looks like a hammerhead. There's only 10 of these operational cranes left in the world. Three of them are in Japan. Uh, one of them is the UNESCO World Heritage Site in Nagasaki. Sasbo has one and we still use it. And so in honor of that, for this presentation and for this, uh, this happy hour, I created this drink, which is kind of your standard uh, karaoke box, box um, highball, which is a very popular drink in Japan, except I replaced the uh, soda with Mekon. Uh, Mekon is uh, it's like a tangerine. It's in Sasebo, though. We're famous for our Mekon. We have the best Mekon in Japan, and I'm just saying that from an unbiased point of view. Also, The Last Emperor thought it was pretty good, too. And so I use Sasebo Mekon and a little bit of grenadine to make it red, like our uh, red brick building. Sasebo is also known for having within its naval port, the famous Akarenga, the red brick warehouses from the 1800s. Kure, Sasebo, and Maizuru, all three still have their warehouses, but I think ours are the best looking. Of course, unbiased. Also, you have to warn people, if they use the Mekons, you said it was extremely messy uh, to make. Yeah, so a Mekon is a thin skin. You can just, I have one right here because it's, I mean, why would I have Mekons on hand? So you put it in the juicer, just even with the skin on, it just sports out the side. So these things, I mean, you don't need a peeler. They just fall right apart real easy. So if you make this at home, a little bit of warning. It's a little yes. bit. So. Mekons are also sweeter, I think, than your average orange. Uh, this, by the way, comes from my wife, um, my wife's friend's farm. She has oh. a friend who is an organic farmer. And so she will sometimes mail us boxes of Mekon. And last time we had 90 Mekon, she's like, David John, I think we should share with our friends. And I'm like, who says there's going to be enough left for sharing? <laughs> and she's like, but these things only last a week. And I said to her, well, you underestimate my powers. I love Sasebo Mekons. These are just the best. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, that, thank you, David, for answering our questions. Uh, we're glad to have you here once again. And uh, thank you to our web audience for joining us today. Thank you.